Welcome to Smart Women Talk. This is your host, Katana Abbott. I'm a midlife millionaire coach and a certified financial planner, and I search the world for smart women and a few good men, including best-selling authors and thought leaders who are on that leading edge. So join us for conversations on money, business, health, and inspiration, so you can live with more purpose, passion, and prosperity. Hello, everyone. This is Katana Abbott, and I really want to welcome you to Smart Women Talk. Today, I'm with food freedom coach, Beth Basham, and she is going to be talking to us about this idea of intuitive eating and mindfulness and, you know, getting off yo-yo diets. We're going to talk about ditching keto and intermittent fasting and, and other diets that are just great ways to reprogram your mind and your relationship with with food. And it's just so important. So we're going to also talk about how eating, get this, without restriction helps your body feel more freedom and also how to live your best life. We're also going to talk about how to get to the root of your relationship with food. So it, and it doesn't really require a lot of time. And you're going to find today, she's going to share some tips to actually help you save time. So Beth Basham is a food freedom coach, a registered dietitian with over 15 years of experience in helping women achieve long lasting success with their health and their peace of mind. And of course, to have peace with their bodies, because we know how we all feel about our bodies. It seems like no one's happy with their hair or their bodies nowadays. So Beth, welcome. Thanks for being so patient. I'm so glad you're here. Oh, it is my sincere pleasure to be here today. I am very passionate about this subject. So I was thrilled when you invited me on the show. I have a lot to share. Yes, yes. So, you know, Beth, we always love getting to know our guests a little bit more by having them share their stories. And and I'm just curious, how in the world did you become a food freedom coach? Was there something that happened in your life? Because you also are a registered dietitian. Yes, that's a wonderful question. And I think it's an important aspect of the work I do, because I think all of us have a mission. And our mission is usually stems from some personal experience we have. And mine is no different, you know, and my answer to your question here is really twofold, you know, part of the reason I do the work I do and have become a transformational food freedom coach is because of my professional life and being a dietitian for so many years, seeing what works, what doesn't work with private clients. But Uh, kind of connected to that was my own personal journey. And early in my career as a dietitian, you know, I came out of my undergrad and my internship to become a registered dietitian thinking I had all the tools to actually keep myself healthy and thin and whatever this ideal body was in society today. I knew everything about what to eat. I knew I could look at a plate of food and count the calories, tell you the protein, fat. And I thought that was the key to my health and happiness right there. I was also a dancer growing up. So I had a lot of time in front of a mirror and constantly looked and uh, looked at my body and, and said things to myself that I would never have said to my best friend, right? We just are so much more critical of our own selves than we are of others. And so for that reason, I, you know, I went into the world of dietetics, thought I had all the tools, but what started to happen was I started to change. My body started to change as I became a woman and I didn't dance as much anymore. I'd started to put on some weight and I started to become extremely uh, restrictive with my diet. So I was counting calories. I was, you know, watching all of the different things. I was exercising obsessively. And instead of seeing these results, like seeing what should happen (laughs) in accordance to what I'd learned in school, my body started pushing back against me. And I started gaining more weight. Every time I got in the scale, the more I restricted, the more I gained, Mm -hmm. Um, the more I exercised, the worse I felt I had fatigue, my hair was thinning. I mean, what people might, you know, call now it's a flashy word on the internet, it's called adrenal fatigue. That's actually not what it is. But that was more or less the symptoms I was experiencing. And I all along this journey hated my body. And here I was, I was about four or five years into my career as a dietitian, trying to help other people be healthy. And I didn't have what it took 
to keep myself healthy or healthy, you know, and that was, that was something that made me feel like a fraud in many ways. And so through the searching and the, I did every diet out there, Katana, I mean, I was, you name it, I tried it or at least dabbled in it. And what I learned, Can you name I, just I, a couple of them. Oh, sure. I did something and people might not know what this is, but I did something called metabolic typing. Um, I did low carb versions. They weren't called keto back then, but lower carb type of uh, restriction. I did like the calorie counting apps. I also did HCG. I know that I know you mentioned that <laughs> you have have tried that one. Um, I, I, you know, without going on and on, I mean, there was a lot of different things that I dabbled in. I took courses. I mean, I spent not just the the physical pain, but there was a lot of emotion and time spent trying to understand this. And it wasn't until I was introduced to the concept of intuitive eating and really integrated mindfulness. So during this time, I also became a yoga instructor. I've, I've always been interested in the metaphysical, yeah. uh, what the drivers behind, like the deeper underneath of our function as humans. And so I started to just put together that these diet plans weren't working. I just, I, I couldn't do it anymore. So what happened was I was, I stumbled upon new information about how to actually reprogram our relationship. So what wasn't, my problem wasn't the weight uh, that I was putting on my body or taking off my body. It was this relationship I had with food that was really destructive to my mental and emotional well-being. And that just, that started things off. This was about 10 years ago. And since then, I have just been quenching for knowledge about how to help women reclaim their relationship with food and body that's positive, uplifting. And quite frankly, it's very little, very little um, has to do with our the weight that we keep on our bodies and very much about the relationship that we have with our bodies, the relationship we have with our plate. So that's what kind of got this party mm-hmm. started. Um, I've since spent a lot of time with uh, specifically women coaching and training them how to reprogram that relationship with food and body so that they can experience long lasting results. So I hope, please ask questions or I hope that. Oh was, no, that's the, the story is amazing going for. because I, I think it's, it's very common that, that a lot of women have gone through this. Of, oh. you know, I mean, I had a friend in high school that thought she she was big boned. I mean, she really was big boned and kind of like a tomboy. And then I remember um, we were at boarding school and she got anorexia and she just turned into the skeleton and her period stopped and her hair fell out, just like you were saying. And she had to go to the hospital. And, you know, why why is it we do this to ourselves? Because I know, you know, I, I'm getting goosebumps and feeling like I want to cry when I think about that, because it w- no one knew how to help her. Oh, my gosh. And I hear the same story from women all over the place. It's rare that you come across a woman who hasn't been affected by this diet culture. And that's what it is. And you, there's a lot of great books you can read about the origins of diet culture that stem back 100, 200 years. But the reality is, is that all of us are subjected to these unrealistic ideals of what a healthy body is. Mm -hmm. And some of that comes from our medical community. And I'm not, you know, I'm not throwing anybody under the bus when I, when I say what I'm about to say, but there is so much emphasis on weight loss as a key component of treatment plans within the medical community. How many women have gone to the doctor and the doctor says, just lose weight and X, Y, and Z will be solved. So women go to extreme lengths, men too. This isn't just exclusive for for women. I've talked to men with body dysmorphia and it's probably much more prevalent than you'd think. But women specifically, they push and force and restrict and do all these extreme things to, uh, to fix themselves in the, in the name of weight, because the doctor told them, the dietitian told them, whomever it was. And when we do that, we put ourselves in a place where we actually do a disservice to our body. We stop listening to the internal cues that we were innately born with, Katana, the stuff that my daughter, my young little daughter has as part of her. I see it, you know, as as she was nursing when she was an infant all the way until now, and she's eating in this intuitive way. She knows she can self-regulate. Some meals she eats more, some meals she eats less. But when we're in a diet mentality, what happens is we 
override those internal cues with all this logic and all this should and shouldn't this good food, bad food lists, instead of listening to our bodies and tuning into what we truly actually need, which may or may not be in connection with the diet plan that we're currently on. So I, do you have any questions about that? Yeah, am I, am I making well, I do sense? have a question when you're talking about the intuitive thing. I just took a test, um, Ayurveda test and found out I'm Vata, okay. 50% Vata. Mm -hmm. Did I pronounce it right? Vata, yeah, I mean, there's, Vata. I, I'm sure there's different <laughs> ways, tomato, tomato, right? Yes, yes. And and so I'm one, and then my husband, he's opposite, he's Kapha, right? Okay. And, and so, you know, I notice how he exercises and how he eats is totally different. When I took the, um, ex the test, and then I read about this, then it helped a lot. But are these kind of things going to be helpful for us? Because when I did read that, it made me feel very, you know, kind towards myself, because then I understood, you know, that I'm cold all the time, and I am a certain way. And then it told me the types of foods, and I and understood why I like certain foods as well. So so what do you think of those kind of programs? I mean, because that's not really a diet per se, but, you know, are there any things like that that we should be looking for to help us out? Because it's very difficult to try to sort through all the different diets. That is absolutely true. I will <laughs> remark and say, yes, you're right. It is very difficult. Even as a nutritionist myself, I, there's all kinds of information coming in from left and right fields. And you question yourself and how much do I actually know about nutrition when there's all this information coming in? So how is it that someone without a nutrition degree can sift and sort through this, right? It's very overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, now your question about Ayurvedic medicine. Now I would, yeah. I would argue that a lot of the Eastern philosophies have had a handle on the fact that um, we all thrive on something different when it comes to food and nutrition. What I will add to that is that we not only thrive on something different from person to person, but also from moment to moment, you know, in different life stages. So what you thrive on as a young child is going to look very different than what you thrive on in your 30s, 40s, 50s and beyond that changes. And even things like the, the, um, the diet, and they still are diet plans that come from the Ayurvedic space. I mean, likely they're also attached to mindfulness practices and other things that help you sift and sort from your own internal wisdom. Mm -hmm. However, they still are, they can be depending on where they come from, restrictive in nature. So it's important that even under that level of Ayurvedic medicine, which I'm not putting down in any way, I find it extremely fascinating. Um, but I also recognize there is still a little bit of that good food, bad food thing going on, even in those in the in those different spaces, uh, even if it's something that's coming from Eastern medicine or, or philosophy, what you're getting at here is that there is differences between all of us. And one person like if your neighbor com comes to you and is like, I have just lost 30 pounds on keto, you might think to yourself, if she could do it, then I can thrive on keto keto too. But what you find is when you go into that keto lifestyle change, you don't feel great. Maybe you're losing weight, but you feel like terrible, you know, and your health actually deteriorates instead of elevates. Mm -hmm. So it's important to recognize that when people or marketers or whomever put together a diet plan, it's usually a one size fits all. And that is just not who we are as humans, we have a different need, not only from person to person, but from moment to moment within our lifetime. So intuitive eating is a practice that helps you reconnect with that internal wisdom and literally from moment to moment, tune into what you need. Wow. Through gentle and uh, nutri well, nutrition you guidance. An example, because, you know, it sounds too good to be yeah. true because oh, I know, right? <laughs> Oh, I, you know, I'm, I'm just dying for some chocolate. And so I'm just supposed to go get some, right? <laughs> well, and, and that actually is a practice within intuitive eating is, um, and, and I don't want to, I don't want to make this too simplistic because it, it does have different facets to it. And there's different personalities that come to the table, if you will, when it comes to things like eating chocolate or sugary things. But the idea is that we we instead of eating food from a place of good or bad or from judgment, you know, oftentimes we look at a bar of chocolate as you offered here in this example, and we have 
judgment about that chocolate, right? It's good or it's bad. And there's reasons that we come up with those judgments because somebody told us this or that, you know? And so when we go into the experience of eating the chocolate, our thoughts, our emotions, and our beliefs are actually having a, a, a physical effect on our body. And this is where that mindfulness piece comes in. And this is what I get so excited about because the thinking about the chocolate, if we believe or think that this chocolate is going to negatively impact our health, it becomes on some level a self-fulfilling prophecy in our body, does it not? So the chronic dieter who's been told that you can't ever eat sugar if you want to be healthy is going to eat that sugar because she's driven to for whatever biological reason, and she's going to feel guilty and in judgment of herself for doing it. And that has a profound impact on everything from her digestion to the metabolism of the chocolate itself. So does the emotion of guilt or anxiety cause like some kind of bad hormones, like, you know, adrenaline or something too? I mean, could it be that is that occurring at the same time? Yes. And there, okay. yeah. Yeah. If you want to get more into the science, we have our well, audience. I'm wondering. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know where your listeners are coming from, from a science point standpoint, but we have an auto, uh, something in us called an autonomic nervous system that's separated into two sides, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Both are very important for survival and living a genuinely beautiful life. But when the sympathetic side, which is also uh, called the fight or flight response side of our nervous system is chronically elevated and turned on, which can be a result of thoughts and beliefs, negative thoughts and beliefs around food that's chronically turned on, we're going to see increases in hormones such as cortisol and insulin that are more pro-inflammatory that actually elevate blood sugar that can lead to weight gain long term. Now, mm. if you have, so I, I don't want to just simplify and say, if you have one bad thought about chocolate yeah. while you're eating it, you're going to gain five pounds. That's not how this works. This is a lifetime of thinking and being immersed in diet culture culture that places this chronic stress on the woman and her mind and her thoughts and her beliefs, chronically thinking that these foods are good, these foods are bad, right? And that chronic stress is what leads to those gentle yet uh, very profound influences on our hormonal systems, right? As, as women, we're, we're pretty complicated, right? We have mm-hmm. not only daily rhythms, we have monthly rhythms, okay? Right. Whether or not you're menstruating, you still have something called an infradian cycle. And diet culture kind of trains us out from listening to those ebbs and those flows of those cycles and rhythms. So here's my, I guess my take home point is when you're eating a bar of chocolate, you're gonna have judgment come back and judgment come through Mm -hmm. And so one thing we can do in this moment and this time is to see those judgments and dismiss them and allow this practice of neutrality to come into our relationship with food, just as an example. Does that make sense? So we can say, thank you for sharing, right? We say that to our intuition, right? Thank you for sharing. Or that's more going to be from Yes, That's our ego coming in, right? Saying you're bad, you're going to get fat, right? Thank you for sharing. But I know that's not true. And then you go on with the true belief. And so how does someone start to shift those beliefs about Absolutely. food? Because that's, or, you know, or shift beliefs about their body. You know, I know you talk about falling in love with who you are, right? Mm. Your own body, mm-hmm. and, you know, and stop judging yourself and being so critical and start looking for the good points. What are some of the things we can do to change our beliefs about our food and our body? Yeah, that's a great question. And likely we'll only touch the tip of the iceberg today. But I I think you bring up a really good point. And this is something that I think is really important for a woman to understand that this is not necessarily the easy journey, the shifting of thoughts and beliefs and emotions, almost that subconscious programming that we that was kind of instilled in us in the earlier years of our life is difficult to change. Um, So the first thing I believe is so important for all women to do is to reject the diet culture first. So just to say, you know what, this diet culture, 
doesn't work for me anymore. I am ready to open myself to a new path, to a new way and a new perspective. That's really important for anybody to just stay open-minded to the fact that there might actually be a better way or a different way that could really support their health journey. The second thing I'd uh, recommend is practice uh, practicing self-compassion. So as these negative thoughts come up, it can feel and it can take time for you to completely dismiss or release the, um, the more depleting emotions that we have around food or body. I've worked with for women for months at a time and they're making so much progress and success, but they come back and they say, Beth, I had this thought kind of leak in, you know, this, uh, this judgment come up for me when I looked in the mirror yesterday. And I want to normalize that, you mm -hmm. know, I've been on this journey for 10 years, and I still have fleeting moments where I look in the mirror, and I'm like, hmm, that doesn't look the way it used to. <laughs> you know, As I get older, as my body changes and shifts as it inevitably will, I go through this over and over. This is a practice, you know, for all of us on this planet, it's always a practice and self-compassion and just being being witness to ourselves in those moments where we're feeling uh, maybe a little less than, <laughs> mm -hmm. it's okay, you know, and just to practice that self-compassion in those moments and recognize that this is a journey, you know, this is a journey. And to join other women in community who are on the same journey. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, Katana, but I have always thrived in the presence of other women who are embarking on a journey similar to mine. And so when somebody's interested in, in diving into mindfulness or intuitive eating, having a community to connect with can be critical because diet culture inevitably will make its way back to your front of mind through social media, through your friend who's doing the keto and lost 30 pounds. And here you are in an intuitive eating journey. You know, it can be very, very sexy to go back to dieting. And it's important to have a community that you can lean on for support during those tough moments when you're feeling that pull. Let's talk a little bit about your program, because do you do group, do you do individual? How does that work? Because I truly believe in having a community. That's why I started Smart Women's Empowerment Program, because we are a community. So what is your philosophy with that? I'm just curious. No, that's a great question. <laughs> everyone, everyone comes with a different uh, set of needs. Mm -hmm. uh, one I think we can agree on is just having community of support. So what I've created in, in how I work with clients or patients or however you want to call them, is I have different levels of support. So I have just a free Facebook community support, mindful and intuitive eating for women. It's pretty easy <laughs> just to type into the search bar, free community just to access some information, some goodies around how to do this and, and be in a support space online with women who are also embarking on this journey. So that's just an opportunity to learn and start to immerse yourself into whether or not this type of engagement with food and body is right for you. And then when I work more intimately with clients, I do a hybrid program. So I have a program where I intimately work with a, a woman for up to six months on the process of becoming a mindful and intuitive eater. And it includes group, community, Facebook community, and individual support. So I really try to create this very safe and supportive container for the, the women who choose to, you know, take the next step and really immerse themselves in the work. So, so the answer to your question is it's a hybrid because I think we need both. It's good to have just that one-on-one -on -one intimacy with the person, the professional that you're working with, but it's also, and this is something I learned a few years ago, I started a PCOS support group at a local doctor's office and I didn't know how it would work. I was like, Oh, they all have their own health issues and they're coming from different angles. But when they got in the room together, and you see this with your community too, right? Mm -hmm. It was like, oh my gosh, I've been there too. Yeah, that's hard. Like, how can we get through this? And you just, what happens is a person feels less alone. You know, mm -hmm. they feel less alone. And they can take steps forward and be rooted and cheered on by their peers, which I think is almost more important than the cheering that I do as a health professional. Like, sure, I've been there. I was immersed in diet culture for most of my life and I've gotten out, but just to have someone going through the journey with you is huge. So I've, I find for the downs and the ups. So when they're really yes. struggling, right. 
Like oh, I just absolutely. blew it last night type of thing, you know, yeah. or when they really want to celebrate because, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. it's hard to do that because you don't want to go to friends. First of all, they're going to lecture you, right? Or may not mm -hmm. understand why you're doing or what you're doing. And then you have to justify what you're doing. And, and you so, question it. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, so so that's great to have that that kind of support for people. So is the group program more for the learning and then the one-on-one -on -one is more for tweaking and customized stuff that someone might need? Yeah, yeah. And every client that goes through it gets a hybrid. So they get time with me directly and also time in the group. It comes in one container in one shell. So they get both. Everyone gets both. I wanted yeah. to ask you this reprogramming our thoughts and attitudes and beliefs. I mean, this is something you actually teach is how to reprogram the mind. How do you help someone reprogram? I know all of us have these beliefs that were formed when we were little. Yes, we're rewiring our brain for a healthy relationship with food and body because that diet culture for so many women starts at a very, very young age. I mean, some, some research now says that there are girls as young as age five and six who are going on a diet. And that is scary. Katana, that scares me to no end. I have a daughter and I just want to prevent that in any way I can for her. Even if we have all these positive affirmations and we're like, I can do this, da, 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 rah, rah, rah. If we don't get to the root of the issue, which happens in, sub in the subconscious brain or the identity of our ourselves at that deeper level, even the most excited person coming into a program on mindful and intuitive eating may find it's just like another diet program. It doesn't stick because they still see themselves as a woman who can't get healthy or can't, you know, it can't work for a number of reasons tied back to that subconscious subconscious programming uh, from earlier on in her life. So we have to look at identity and what is our identity around food and body and how can we start to shift that through you know, language, um, through how we talk to ourselves through meditation, you know, I use um, a lot of my training as a yoga teacher, I also have a background in functional medicine, and there's a lot of holistic elements to that, that are so important that we integrate as we become a more mindful, intuitive eater. So we actually shift our entire identity around food or body and who we are in relationship to food. Man. And it seems like when we can repro this idea of reprogramming, you know, the neuro um, neuroplasticity of the brain, I guess we really truly can reprogram. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And everyone, every woman comes with a different set of programming. So we have to untangle that, see it for what it is with you know, through the lens of love and compassion, you know, removing judgment, I always, I, I have something in my program called the curiosity cure. So instead of approaching something as we must figure it out, it's more, how can we stay curious and open minded to what's underneath, and explore that and be really honest with ourselves. Because when we can, and we expose that subconscious belief, it's at that time, we can start to kind of pull it apart. I even work with a hypnotherapist in my program. She works with some of my women to help climb into the subconscious a little deeper to help them reveal those deeper layers if we're not able to do it just with the the programming or the exercises and the things that I offer in the program. Well, so because think of that if you have like bad feelings and that type of thing inside of you or memories, you know, food can just relieve that. It's like such a fast boost, yeah. right? You eat something sugary and then whoosh, you know, oh, I feel better now, but not for long. <laughs> Yeah. And we need to forgive ourselves. Yeah. And that's, you know, like an indicator of emotional eating. And mm -hmm. I, I want to remind the women listening, if you've ever connected to that idea, oh, I'm an emotional eater. This is a perfect opportunity to be compassionate for yourself because for so many of us, when we didn't have, if we didn't have food to soothe in that moment, we could have very well embarked on much more um, harmful vices, right? Mm -hmm. So food as a coping mechanism, although yeah, we like to shift that and change that going forward. It's kind of a nice thing to say, gosh, thank you for being there, bowl oh. of ice cream, because, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, in that moment, I could have done a lot of other things that were self destructive, alcohol, yeah. drugs, um, you know, I don't know, you name it, there's lots of things out there that are, are much worse. Right. But right. Um, 
you know, so sorry, that was a bit of a side tangent. But no, it's fine. It's true. Because I think people are relating to you. Well, you know, we're, we're at the um, top of the hour. Thank you so much for being here today with us. Katana, I cannot tell you how much fun this was. And I appreciate your time and your energy as well. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. So for everyone, thank you so much for being here today. And until next time, go out and live with more purpose, passion and prosperity. Smart Women Talk is brought to you by Smart Women's Empowerment, a 501c3 nonprofit project of United Charitable. Music by Bill Lucas from his album, When It Rains. Available on Apple, Music, and Spotify. Catch us wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. And be sure to join our free community at joinsmartwomen.com to access all our free Smart Women resources.